hanging out with Greg Laurie too many years. <laughs> He's always coming up with something. <coughs> he did that to us a few times. everybody thank you for coming welcome bless you could join us tonight um, before we begin our worship service why don't we uh, stand up and then we'll pray ask the Lord to be here to minister to us and that we would be all in to worship him amen, amen. father thank you Lord for Wednesday night a midweek time that we can come together for fellowship to study the word father to to worship to pray together and just enjoy each other's company. Uh, Lord, we just welcome you to be a part of it. We ask the Holy Spirit come and fill our hearts, that he would teach us and open our eyes and our understanding to the things that we learn, that, Lord, our hearts would be fully engaged in worshiping you, and we would do so from thankfulness. Lord, flood our mind with the blessings of which we each of us are blessed with. We have so much living in America, so much we should be truly thankful for, and tonight is an opportunity to come back and say thank you. So, Lord, would you anoint our time together, bless our worship team, bless Gary as he brings the word tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. All right.
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to
be seated um, before Gary comes up and shares from the word just a couple announcements um, we want to be praying for Marty and Lori as they're taking a little respite getting some rest and uh, we'll do that tonight looking forward to praying with you tonight on the Saturday the 21st I'm going to take a team of people back on the streets to do a little evangelism but also doing the door hangers again get word out there is a good Bible teaching Christ-centered church in the local area, come and visit. So I have all the door hangers, love to have you join us if you uh, have that desire in your heart. We're going to meet at the Starbucks on the 21st, that's a Saturday morning from 9 at 9, and then we'll go out on the streets for two hours, get done at 11, probably have lunch together, and after that um, you have the rest of your day ahead of you, which is nice. So looking forward to having that time with you. This Sunday... We have our potluck, and so think of a favorite dish. Either you purchase it or make it yourself and bring it out. I need. I heard uh, they men, uh, mentioned on Sunday that we need more desserts. I just I vote that we have nothing but dessert. Okay, okay. Hey, there we go. Second vote. That's it. 
<laughs> dessert for everybody. Life's short. Just have dessert. Um, and so we got those two things on the calendar. Um, and I believe, oh, this Saturday we have the men's prayer breakfast at Andy's starting at 7 o'clock. So guys, come on out. Look forward to spending some time with you guys in the Word and prayer and fellowship. That's always a good time. So a lot going on here. And um, look forward to what the Lord has for us in this fall semester or this fall year coming up, right? We're starting to get some of that um, weather. Praise God, the 100 degrees over. We're in the 80s. Hallelujah. So, Gary, why don't you come on up and pray and give us the word. Hey, good evening. I was going to say, uh, Rick's uh, hearing of for desserts, I think that was a personal request. So, yeah. um, anyways, let's pray, and then uh, let's see what the Lord has for us. Father, Lord, we just come before you. We thank you so much, Lord, that we can get together here tonight and worship you, Lord, and praise you, and, uh, and then learn about you, Lord. Lord, we need to know more about you. I love those worship songs, just, um, just really embodying uh, the message that we have here tonight, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray you minister to all of us tonight, Lord. Uh, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Enable me to be your vessel. Lord, speak life into this message, Lord. Speak life into us, Lord. And, Lord, uh, we're excited to meet with you here tonight. We know your presence is here. And so we thank you so much. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Can you guys hear me from this distance? I'm going to set up my... Speak louder? Oh, okay. Perfect. I can. Don't, don't tempt me. I got that voice that carries. <laughs> um, well, tonight we are going to be in 1 John chapter 2. And we're going we're gonna to go through verses 1 through 11. I was, th I was like, man... It's going through it, reading through it. I was like, there's just so much here. There's no way I can get through all this. It's just too much meat, too much meat and potatoes. And so, uh, um, you know, I decided to, well, I think the Holy Spirit decided to, to slow it down a little bit and not try to rush through this chapter. It's an important chapter. And so, um, you know, we're going to be picking up from where Pastor Marty last left off. Um, last week, before going over chapter one, Pastor Marty did a great job giving us an overview of all that's entailed in the first epistle of John, but then also giving us the historical context of this letter, and then the reason and purpose for which John wrote this letter to the churches of Asia Minor. Uh, to, re to reiterate some of uh, what Pastor Marty said last week, um, at the writing of this letter, John is currently residing in Ephesus, and he is pastoring over the church of Ephesus. Uh, uh, but on a, on a regional scale, the church has been Ill infiltrated uh, by and is being attacked by false and heretical doctrines during this time, uh, seeking to pull away these believers who are immature in the faith and who are lacking in knowing God's word and his promises, and also trying to stir up division amongst the believers. And so I believe John has three purposes in mind for the writing of this letter. Number one, to build up the body in the knowledge of the Lord and his promises. To strengthen uh, the bond of fellowship and unity within the church. But then three, to combat the lies of the devil and the false doctrines creeping into the church. Uh, two of these false doctrines um, by name that the churches of, Ages were, churches of Asia were dealing with were called, one was called Gnosticism which kind of combined Eastern mysticism with uh, Greek dualism, which is, it's basically saying this, everything of this, it's spiritual things, good, anything material is evil, it's bad. And Corinthian, Corinthianism um, is the, the other one, which it basically says, uh, Jesus was just a man whom, whom the Christ descended upon at the baptism and then left, just, just before the crucifixion, so that Christ never suffered and died for our sins. And so we see how, uh, um, you know, these false doctor, doctrines are both adding to and then taking away from the simpleness of the gospel. Um, John recognized these false doctrines as a threat to the church and was proactively combating the lies by instructing the body in God's promises 
and then reminding them of the confidence and assurance that they have in the Lord and his word. Um, but then Jen, John also doesn't pull any punches here. Uh, um, you know, he gives, uh, he gives some, some, uh, some tough biblical truths that are meant to be applied to our life. And so there's a lot of promises in this, in this passage, um, a lot of application in this passage. But John is just, uh, again, we just see his loving example. And I think uh, John is a great example of Christian authenticity. And so, uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. The title of my message is The Attributes of the, Auth- of the Authentic Christian. And so let's go ahead and read. Um, you guys can stand for the reading of the word. And we're going to read 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And so John says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the world. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He, he who says he abides in him ought, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write to you no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You guys can be seated. So the first thing I would like to say uh, about John is just how simple and clear he makes his point known. Right? He says, hey, I'm writing to you because of this. You know, he, kind of, he just lays it out very simply. And so uh, he's not uh, speaking above their heads or from a pedestal, but simply so they can easily understand, uh, but then also lovingly as well. I, but I, I just, again, I love how simply he writes it that even us today, 2,000 years later, again, it's, it's as clear as day, right? And so, um, you know, he's very clear in what he's going to say to them. Um, but then we see in the beginning of verse 1, that John calls the readers his little children. Uh, this word for children in the Greek is a figurative term. He's not saying you're my literal children, right? You're, but my figurative children. And it is used as a term of endearment, right? John saw himself as a loving father, and every believer under his care he saw as, as his child or to care for, to nurture, but then to instruct them and grow them in the ways of the Lord. And so as we're looking kind of at the authentic uh, Christian, I think the first uh, kind of what we need to focus on, not just John's words, but his example, is that um, uh, he's got a love for the body of Christ, right? He's got this, past, this fatherly love like Christ does for the church. And so if I can, if I can pick like a modern-day example of John, someone that, I, that really reminds me of John, I think of Pastor Chuck Smith, right? Someone who just had that fatherly care, um, that paternal love for the body of Christ. Uh, Through Pastor Chuck, many pastors were trained up who then went out and started many churches bringing many unbelievers to Christ, right? He was all about building up the body and sending them out. Kind of remind me of, uh, you know, a, a father teaching his kid to ride a bike. You know, that you start them out on their training wheels, you know, but once as they start to mature and grow, you take those training wheels off and you begin to try to teach them to ride that bike and you walk alongside them, uh, you know, as they're, ri- as they're building up speed, right? They're, they're getting their balance, they're getting their momentum, and then 
you let them go. And sometimes they fall. Uh, but you keep picking them back up, keep doing it, and until they finally just take off and they're riding on their own. And then, and then like any father is just cheering his kids on, right? And I just think of, when I think of, um, you know, John the Apostle, um, it just reminds me of Pastor, Pastor Chuck. And so, um, again, just a, a father teaching his children on how to um, move forward in the world. And it's just a beautiful thing. And so he starts, uh, um, and so again, that first, uh, my first maybe attribute is that love for the body of Christ that we need. But moving back to uh, the reason that he says, right? He says, hey, these things I'm writing to you because of this, right? John is writing them so he says that, that they will not sin or so that they may not sin. John is claiming by this statement, um, this statement is pretty uh, important because he's claiming you can have victory over sin. When he's, when he's saying, I'm writing to you because of this, that you guys may not sin, he's saying you can have victory over this. You don't have to remain in sin. And so how do we have victory over sin? I think that's a great question, right? Um, there's I mean, there's a lot of points. I just wrote down five quick ones, um, five ways to have victory over sin. I know there's more. Um, but ver- number one, I put, we must fight in God's strength and not our own. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, we all know it. It's the armor of God. But he says, uh, uh, oops, hold on. I had this. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil, right? Um, But be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God doesn't intend us to fight in our own strength, right? He intends to fight for us. And so, um, you know, the, the first way I have is be strong in God's strength, not your own. Um, James four, seven says this, it says also says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee for you. And so our submission, our humbleness before the Lord, right? Reckon our need for him. Recognize I need you to step in, right? Um, He's going to give us that ability to resist the devil and to have victory over sin. Um, Number two, I put for the second point, I put our proximity to God. Um, Our proximity to God is important. John 15.4 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And that word abide, we're going to, you know, we're going to see that through this passage, or we already have as we read it, uh, but it means to dwell, to cling to. I like the example of uh, oatmeal that you leave out in the middle of the night, you know, um, and the next day you come to that, that oatmeal is clinging, is sticking, is abiding in that bowl, right? Like you can't get that thing off, right? And that's going to be a picture of abiding in the Lord, right? We need to cling to the Lord, cling to him. Now, the third, the third uh, um, thing I wrote down, the third point I wrote down for Um, victory over sin is we must call him into the fight right we got to call the lord into the fight psalm 50 verses 15 says this says call upon me in the day of trouble and and i will deliver you and you shall glorify me i I like that last part you know and you shall glorify me he's like i'm gonna show up you know i'm showing up and i'm showing up in a major way and it's gonna it's gonna you know you're gonna your mind's going to be blown how I show up. But that we, when we call upon him, we need to know he's going to step in, right? Kind of going back into James, when, he, when we ask for something, we need to not doubt, right? Especially if it's according to his will, right? We need to not doubt the promises of God. And God says, call upon me in that day of trouble, and I will show up, and you're going to glorify me. The fourth uh, um, point I wrote down for victory over sin we need to remove anything that will tempt us to sin. We need to get that uh, away from us. Romans thirteen fourteen says, put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We need to remove any possible provision 
uh, to fulfill the lust of the flesh, whether that's, you know, phones, turns phone, whatever, you know, uh, accountability apps, uh, computers in the other room, whatever it is, video games, I don't, you know, whatever the issue is, get it, you know, remove the provision of sin, get it far from you. Like, like Joseph, who ran from Potiphar's wife, right? He, he got out of there, right? Um, we need, to, we need to remove that temptation of sin. Fifth point, real quick, prayer. You can't do it without prayer, right? Prayer will, prayer's our weapon. Again, I, I talked about calling upon the Lord, but we also need to call upon our brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? We got to get on the horn, so to speak, and, and call them up and ask them to pray for us. We have a chapter a day, and we have, we have a group apps and different things like that, or we have, um, we have prayer chains and all that stuff. We do this tonight, too. We pray together. And so asking each other to pray for one another, you know, and to give us victory over sin, you know, prayer is so important, but the body of Christ is, is equally as essential in the victory over sin. And so we see then that John says that if anyone does sin, now he's going on, he's kind of talking about the possibility of sin. He says, we have an advocate with the Father. First off, John isn't license, licensing or saying it's okay to sin. Um, he's also not talking about continual unrepentant sin, but sin as a singular, uh, you know, action that happens um, in the future, right? And so, um, uh, an, an action that we must be repentant over. And this verse is strongly connected uh, to the promises he wrote in 1 John 1, 9, where he says, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this verse is expanding on that promise in that Jesus is also our advocate. The word actually means helper. It's not that it's uh, not this. It's a different word than uh, the, the word helper that refers to the Holy Spirit. Um, but he, he says helper before the father. Right. And so if the if the devil is the accuser, the one who accuses us before the father, then Jesus is the one who is defending us. Right. Speaking for us on our behalf. And so in, in verse two, um, it connects to this by adding that Jesus is the propitiation or atonement uh, for our sins. But then it also adds for the whole world. Right. For the believer in Christ. But then it says for the whole world as well. You know, sadly, amongst uh, some doctrines and denominations, they believe that Christ only died for the elect. Um, or the Christian, or the Christian, and actually do, you know, they change the meaning of John three sixteen, right? When it says, "For God so loved the world," in some Christian denominations, they change what "world" means there. Contextually, "world" never means the body of Christ within the Scriptures; it never does. Um, but this is the this is how important us knowing what God's word is, right? We can see how something a verse so. Um, I think plain as day, right? I think the gospel, John 3, 16, is plain as day. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believe, yeah, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. To me, that's plain as day. But we see how um, when we don't know God's word and we follow the breadcrumbs of, of other people, right, of YouTube preachers or whatever, you know, but we don't spend time in God's word and we don't know God's word ourselves. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. Then we can see how we can be misled. And so, um, you know, to me, uh, these passages in John three sixteen, but then this one where it says Jesus is the propitiation, the atonement for the entire world. Um, you know, to me, it's uh, there's something I mean, to misinterpret that. There's definitely something wrong going on there. And so, um, and sadly, that's being taught wrong within the church today. We need to know God's word. Um, going back to, and I'll even add this, is that, um, you know, that's, that is a, in, in, an attribute of an authentic Christian, someone who delights and loves God's word, right? Who, I mean, just read Psalm 119, you know, David, man, he, he loved God's word. 
And, um, and so uh, we need to find our delight and joy in spending time with the Lord through his word. Um, but going back to this word propitiation, this word is actually used in the Greek Septuagint to refer to the blood that is sprinkled upon the mercy seat. Um, and so I just, I like that, is that, uh, you know, going back to the mercy seat, that blood that's sprinkled on the mercy seat. You know, G- and Jesus is the blood that's sprinkled on the mercy seat. He's also the high priest that sprinkles the blood, right? And so it's uh, really cool to think about. Um, but if Jesus is the propitiation for the whole world, uh, then this passage is basically saying that Christ has salvation waiting for them if they repent and put their faith, their faith and trust in Jesus. He's got eternity He's got salvation, he's got hope, he's got joy, he's got peace, he's got the abundant life, sanctification, waiting for the unbeliever in Christ to, but they need to receive, they need to repent, they need to surrender, right? Um, God won't do anything against their will. And so, uh, and to me, it's sad. They have all these blessings waiting for them from the Lord, right? It's sad. And the Lord, his heart breaks because they reject him, right? He loves the unbeliever. And so, um, you know, question, does our hearts break for the, for the unsaved? Do our hearts break for the unbeliever? Not just the unbeliever in our family, right? Not just the prodigal, the stranger that we don't know, a coworker, you know, that is hard to get along with, right, you know? That one, Um, you know, does our hearts break for them, you know, because the Bible tells them they're ensnared by the devil. They've been taken captive to do his will. And so um, another, the third attribute I have for authentic Christianity is a love and burden for the loss. Jesus would look upon the multitudes with compassion Paul desired that his own people, the Jews, would be saved over him. He loved them that much. You know, he had a burden that much for his people, right? He, he, he would rather his salvation be taken from him, that they would be saved. Do we have that, that love for the lost? It's definitely something we can ask the Lord to help us with, right? And, and speaking with prayer, I think that's something that's, you know, I'm continually asking the Lord for, Lord, give me a love for the lost. Help me to um, just see their needs. Be ready to speak to them, you know, wherever they're at. You know, and I know we're, never, we're not perfect in these things, but I, I know I need to pray better. But, but that, that burden for the lost, Lord. We need to be intentional about that. In verse 3, John gives us a test, so to speak, a litmus test for how do we know God. And that word know is gnosko in the Greek, um, but it means to know by experience. Speaking of relational, uh, relational knowledge, right? Not intellectual knowledge, right? And so notice John uses the word we, though, here, right? He said, you know... Uh, he's including himself, right, in this matter, right? He's not, he's not saying, oh, I'm an apostle. I already know. You know, I knew Jesus. Hey, man. You know, but he's including. He's saying we, right? Um, you know, he's including himself in this, in this test. How do we know, right? And, uh, but the, the purpose of this, I think, of this passage is self-inspection, right? The primary purpose, John's primary purpose of verse 3 is self-inspection right is to get the reader to self-inspect where they are at with the lord and not analyze every believer but himself right and i think that's the big mistake of this 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 verse is often used to analyze other believers first and not yourself um in matthew 7 verses uh, 3 through 5 jesus says this he says And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so, um, you know, um, 
you know, kind of going to that passage, many, many of you guys know this, that uh, the root word for spec and plank is of the same, it's like of the same making, right? And so whatever, whatever's in your brother's eye, it's all, you know, that plank is that same sin, right? And so we're so busy, you know, go, oh, Rick, you got this, dink. Meanwhile, I got this, you know, big fat, fat plank of the same exact, you know, nature, right? And so John wants the reader here to look at themselves, right, and consider themselves. And by this, um, you know, he says, if we keep his commandments, right, that word keep means to watch over or to guard over. It doesn't mean you'll be perfect, right? It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect in it. Um, the idea is that we are protecting something of great worth or value or even protecting against something very dangerous, right, depending on the commandment, right? Guarding against or protecting over, right? And so, um, you know, uh, God's word, we should love God's word. Kind of going back to what uh, David, you know, in Psalm 119, I, I wrote this down at the Psalm 119, uh, verse 16 says, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I love that. I will delight myself. I will find my delight in your word, right? Uh, so much, and we can, we can just, you know, shoot over to the whole Psalm 119, but we don't have time today. Um, mm, lost my spot. And so going back to this idea of protecting, you know, um, I think of it as even as like, you know, you protect your wife or your kids, right? You're not going to let something happen to them. You're not going to let something evil happen to them, right? And so uh, uh, when we sin against the Lord, we're allowing evil to reign in our body, right? We're allowing evil to have victory over us or have claim over us. And, you know, when Jesus says, hey, anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old things have ha passed away, behold, all things become new. We're going back to the old man, you know, we're, we're the dog going back to its vomit, right? And so we just need to, uh, you know, have that, that ex exaltation of, uh, of, of dwelling in holiness with the Lord, right? Uh, Romans 12, 1 says to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service, right? It's, our reason, it's, it's, it's a reasonable thing for the Lord to ask. Reasonable. In, uh, Jesus go, but Jesus goes deeper with this. As I was talking, you know, we're just talking about it's a reasonable service to obey the God. Sure. Jesus goes deeper with this. He says in John 14, 15, he says uh, to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? And so um, Jesus is, is bringing him back to the, the relationship, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus likened obedience as a response of love. If we, if we love him and, and our desire is to please him and not, break his heart through sin, then we will do our utmost to obey him, right? And so for the third attribute of our authentic, or this is fourth attribute, excuse me, um, it is a love for the Lord that leads to willful obedience. In verse 4, John goes on to talk about those that say that they know Jesus, but they don't keep, his, keep the commandments, right? Uh, he says they are a liar and the truth isn't in them. That's a pretty harsh statement from the Apostle Love, right? Pretty harsh? Uh, no. I think John's saying that in love, right? Um, again, John's primary purpose was for his readers is that they're going to self-inspect here, right? He wants them to know why they can be confident in their salvation through the promises of God, but then also through the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Now, this scripture does have a, a secondary benefit, too, right, of giving us wisdom and discernment to who is not of the Lord, right? And so, um, but even in the self-inspection part, whoa, you know, I got some sin here, you know, and if I'm looking at this verse, am I truly, am I truly one of the Lord's? Right. And so I think that that's that first take. But in that secondary benefit, um, 
you know, and enables us to, okay, see somebody, okay, th this isn't quite right, okay? This isn't uh, adding up. This isn't following scripture. And so it helps to the believer to be aware of what is not of the Lord, too, right? And so, um, you know, the purpose, though, is, is uh, when we, if we are seeing these things within the church, right, uh, it's not to go, oh, hey, we need to kick him out, right? That's not the purpose. Uh, you know, Matthew 13, Jesus warns us in the parable of the wheat and tares from tearing out the tares, lest you tear out the wheat with it, right? And so, uh, you know, we don't, the tares, in essence, are, is the unbeliever, right? One planted by the devil within the church to stir up division and all that type of stuff. And, and Jesus said, I don't want you to do it. So don't worry about it. My angels will take care of it at the end of the age, right? I'll take care of it, right? Leave that up to me. But because if you do, you can potentially tear up other believers within the church, right? And so, um, um, you know, the, it's, again, it's not about kicking people out, but it's about knowing who not to follow, Right? We don't want to follow someone that is leading us against God's word or the prom or or you know anything, right? Someone who's going to stir up division within the church. But that example too could our example of uh, it can protect other believers. But eventually, if we don't tear this person out of the church, we could potentially lead them to Christ, right? They could be someone that could be led to Christ over time. You know, seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, seeing all you know. Uh, the believers love on them and wanting it, right? Not just wanting the intellectual knowledge of the, of the Bible, right? In Matthew 7, uh, 15 and 16, Jesus uh, warns his disciples of false prophets, kind of going into, he says, uh, you shall know them by their fruit, right? And so the, uh, the, the, the tear, so to speak, within the church, you're going to know them by their fruit. Um, the, the false prophet, you're going to know them by their fruit. And it's not going to be a fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? It'll, it'll self-promote. Um, it also won't be a fruit of obedience. As we're learning, John gives us this test, right? If you, uh, you know, about uh, keeping God's commandments. You know, the, the false prophet, you know, is not going to be somebody that is uh, going to be keeping God's commandments, so do they exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, which is also it's evidence of the believer. It's evidence of the Holy Spirit working inside of the believer. John doubles down on this truth, really, in verse 5. Um, he, he says, um, you know, he's trying to impart an unshakable confidence in, their salvation, in the salvation to the reader, Right? He says, truly, the love of God is perfected in them when they keep his commandments, right? I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, uh, at one point have ran into a stranger, and within 30 seconds, you're like, they're a believer, right? They're a believer. You know it. Why? Because they're speaking Christianese. Is that why? No, no. It's not Christianese, no. It's the love of the Lord within them, the peace of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, right? It's made perfect through their walk of obedience and trust in the Lord. And so, um, you, know, uh, you know, we see that this test, right, as we walk with the Lord, many of you are confident in your salvation because you've seen the Holy Spirit move in your life, work in your life. You've seen the Lord uh, sanctify you. Begin the process of sanctification in you. It's not because you're looking at yourself and going, oh, I'm so great. No, you're seeing the Lord move, right? And that stirs you into obedience, right? He blesses obedience. And so when we obey the Lord and keep his commandments, um, not out of duty, again, kind of going back to the relational part, Right? Not, it's not, I mean, it is our reasonable service, but not out of duty. Out of love for the Lord, then the love of God will be perfected in us and will bring about a confidence in the Lord and his promises because we are seeing the Lord move in our life and be faithful. 
And so the fourth attribute I have for authentic, or fifth attribute, because I added one in the middle of my notes, um, I have for authentic Christianity is that we believe and trust in all the promises of God. We believe and trust in all the promises of God because we're walking with him. We're seeing him move and we're seeing him be faithful. Verse 6, John says, if we say we abide in him, then we should walk as Jesus walked, right? If we're abiding in the Lord, we should, we should look like Jesus. You know, and so if you want to be an authentic Christian, the best thing is to look like Jesus, right? Right? Easy. We can go home now, right? Look like Jesus. Go home. Easy. No, it's not easy, right? We've got to put our flesh to death, right? We've got to humble ourselves before the Lord. Um, what did Jesus look like? Here's a question. That's a sermon in itself, right? Um, let me see if I can sum it up in one sentence. I'll let Jesus sum it up in one sentence. Um, he says, oh, I lost my spot. I will find it. I think it, in Jesus, in one sentence, it would be that he says about himself in John 6, verse, chapter 6, verse 40, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Right? Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Uh, you know, and so my, my fifth at, or my sixth attribute here for Christian, authentic Christianity is the desire of God's will over our own. Not my will be done, but thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. In fact, Jesus, uh, he likens his true family members as to whoever does the will of his father, right? Um, you know, he says, who is my brother or sister, right? He who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother or sister. Verse 7, John reminds us of an old commandment, which is, uh, uh, which is the new commandment Jesus gave in John 13, verses 34, uh, th verse 34, telling them to love one another as Christ has loved them, right? And he says, and he says, by this, all will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And so the, the new commandment uh, that John em is emphasizing is love here. Even though he's saying, you know, a new commandment, old, it's kind of doing some wordplay there. Um, but the, the he's emphasizing the love for one another. And we kind of already talked about that as an attribute. Um, but he goes on to contrast hating our brothers um, with dwelling in darkness, right? Uh, if you hate your brother, you dwell in darkness. But if you love your brother, you dwell in light. And so I think about, you know, as we talked about a love for the body of Christ, but a love for not just the body of Christ in general, but your love for those that are next to you, side by side, in the fight. Can you say that you love each brother by, beside you? I hope so, you know. Um, and we know, that, I mean, it's not easy all the time, right, because of our sinful nature. Our sinful nature tries to get in the way. But we should be, our desire should be to encourage our brother in the Lord and build them up in the Lord and push them forward in the Lord and see them successful, right? And, and, and experience all the joy and the pleasures of the Lord. That should be our heart's desire, not to look at our, you know, our, other bro our brother with envy, right? And desire their position or hope that they fail or whatever, right? Um, again, uh, John contrasts that with light and darkness. He says that... Um, he says that if you are dwelling in light, you abide in light, you won't stumble, right? You won't, which makes, he goes, makes sense. You can see where you're going, right? Uh, any of you guys trip over something in the dark before, right? Not many times, right? Ah, oh, man, you know, but, um, and then, and he contrasts it with the darkness, right? That they can't see, they're blind, right? And, does that make you reconsider, like, man, does that make you even, like, reconsider love it, 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 towards your brother? It does for me. You know, I think about that. It's like, man, if I hate my brother, I'm dwelling in darkness. That's sad. I don't know where I'm going. You know? I'm going to trip. I'm, gonna, I'm already stumbling, right, if I'm hating my brother. You're already in the midst of stumbling. You're in the midst of sin. You're not representing the Lord. And so... Um, 
you know, we, we kind of looked at authentic Christianity uh, here tonight. And uh, to me, John is just this amazing example. Um, but also the, the promises in 1 John. There's so many good promises in 1 John, right? And uh, the assurance, the confidence that we have in these promises. Uh, you know, I'm thankful because like it says, uh, like it said in, in uh, earlier in this chapter, in this text, you know, if you, if you sin, you have an advocate, the helper, Jesus Christ. You know, I love those songs we played tonight um, because it was really about humbly drawing yourself before the Lord. You know, coming back to the Lord, drawing yourself to the Lord, seeking to be renewed and strengthened in the Lord. So my question as we study authentic Christianity is, how is your walk? Do you, can you say you look like Jesus, right? As we, uh, you know, if we abide in him, we'll look like him. I hope you're self-inspecting tonight. I know as I, as I was doing this message, I was self-inspecting. And so, um, you know, um, again, we have amazing promises in God. And going back to that, he's our advocate, but if we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He brings us right back, the propitiation for our sin, right back into fellowship to walk with him. Right, And so if you haven't been walking, my prayer is you repent and come back and start walking. Remove all those things in your way, those distractions, get them out of there, and walk with the Lord, and he'll walk with you. Praise you, love you. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Father, again, we thank you again, Lord, for this night, uh, for your word, that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword and reveals the thoughts and intentions of our heart, Lord. We pray that you uh, go before us tonight in this time of prayer, Lord, this last song of worship, Lord, for we bring you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I kick saved that, by the way. Let's all stand and worship together. and the sea your river runs with love for me and i will open up my heart and let the healer set me free i'm happy to be in the truth and i will daily lift my hands for i will always sing up when your love came down mountains and the sea your river runs with love for me and i will open up my heart and let the healer set me free i'm happy to be in the truth and i will daily lift my hands for i will always sing of when your love came down i could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing up when your love came down. I can sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I 
could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Forever. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Just the voices, sing that again. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. You guys can be seated just for a few moments. Um, we have a great opportunity to be able to pray for various things. And um, I was thinking about this tonight. Um, our prayers are so powerful and very effective. Now, the enemy wants to fight us and get us to believe that, you know, something really it's a waste of time. I really don't see anything happening. But we know the scripture is very clear. The effective, fervent, heartfelt prayers of righteous men and women will avail much. And so I'm thinking, I was watching, like many of you, perhaps watching the debate last night, and you're thinking, oh, man, what a mess we're in. <laughs> and even the presidential candidates admit it. We're in trouble. Yeah, it's, that's a fact. So I was thinking, as, as, we, as the church prays, and I'm sure that God is calling not just our church, but many other churches throughout the country to be praying, this can be a very strategic time. When you're in uh, battle or you're in war, um, they have an, uh, an area of called for artillery. They can launch shells in for miles away into a battle zone. And that's why I want to kind of see our prayers, how effective they can be tonight. There's things like, you know, we're seeing there's so much problems with crime. Uh, we're seeing an invasion across the borders. We're seeing this drugs coming across and killing, I think, in the past few years, 300,000 young people with fentanyl. Uh, this is a tool of the enemy to destroy or to slay the babes. You know, he's been doing it forever. He did it in Jesus' time. They did it all the way back in the Hebrews when they were in Egypt, kill all the, the, ch the male children. The enemy is all about killing our kids. And we're making sure that they don't bear fruit. Wipe out the population. In fact, we know from abortion, a million children in America are killed every year. This is a sin far surpasses the sin that Herod committed when he killed the male, the Hebrew children, two and younger, when he was trying to wipe out Jesus. Um, but we can be strategic and fight these things. And uh, I would encourage us tonight as we break up into various groups, we can be praying for Washington, D.C. We can be praying for the city of Sacramento. We can be praying for Los Angeles. We can be praying for Riverside and know that your prayers are effective. There is children tonight that are being trafficked across the world, and we can be effective in releasing some of those kids, giving the police wisdom to find out where these children are being held and hold, deliver them and hold their captors responsible. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do strategically. We know that people that are sick, we've seen so many people have we seen healed in this ministry. I mean, dozens and dozens of people. Um, so we know it's effective. We know that the scripture is clear. And God says, if, if when you pray, I hear your prayer. Jesus said, ask whatever you want in my name, and that I'll do that the Father is glorified in the Son. He wants us to be confident that when we're praying, we're doing serious damage to the enemy's camp. 
And so Satan is having a field day, and I believe to a large degree it's because the church is not praying. People don't believe in prayer today, and that's pretty sad. But we today, collectively, can do some serious da damage to the enemy's camp by praying for these various issues, hot-button things. I want to begin by praying for all of us. The guys, we're going to get together in a moment. The girls, we can get together in a moment. When you're praying, be strategic. Keep your prayers requests short, short. Remember who it is that you are talking to. God knows all the details. We don't need to give him all the details. He knows. Be strategic in your, in your message or your prayer um, so that we can get everybody to pray. And, and this, when the Spirit starts to move, it's, it's awesome. At, at the Crusades in uh, Anaheim when we do this, when everybody's approached prayer right, First, we're going to plead the blood of Christ. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit come in and ask uh, to invite, uh, to lead us how to pray effectively. I'm going to ask that in just a moment. But when it's done right, there's a spirit that starts moving and people start praying and you can just sense that the enemy's angry and that it's being truly effective. And I know that we can do that tonight. So we're here. I like the idea that we can really change things for good just by you and I for a half hour praying collectively. We will see change. Someone's going to see it. Maybe we may not see it tonight, but it's going to create change because God promises it. Um, national repentance. Um, bind the wisdom of the enemy. Confound the wisdom of the enemy. Dealing with the cartels that are coming across the border, all these uh, the gangs that are killing and raping and things like that. We can pray strategically against that. We might save lives tonight. Ukraine needs help. Israel, the Palestinians on the other side of this war. Do you know you got brothers and uh, sisters that are Palestinian, and they're being killed on the in Gaza too. So that we have brothers and sisters on both sides of the fence here, and uh, there's a lot of people. Our brothers and sisters are dying in prisons in China. They've been held there captive because they are faith in Christ, and they're enemies of the state. And so they kill them over there or jail them for long periods of time. They're crying out to God for help. We can help in delivering them, just like the, prayer, the church prayed for Peter when he was arrested and he was delivered by that angel. When we pray believing God is honored and it moves his mighty hands. Are you guys with me? Let's be really strategic tonight. And there's a lot of things that we can pray for. You're, you're concerned about the violence and the cruelty on the streets? then let's do some serious damage to the enemy's camp. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight's message. Thank you for Gary and just the ways that we can recognize uh, that we have authentic Christian or authentic Christians and believers. And thank you for John's letter to the church. Father, now we have this opportunity after worship uh, to pray strategically. And, Lord, I pray that you would anoint us as we sit at your feet and bring these petitions to you. But first, Father, we want to plead the blood of Jesus over all of us. Lord, that no sin or any might hinder the work of prayer or um, you answering that prayer. Maybe it be unforgiveness. It could be um, disobedience. It could be any of these things. But if we will confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, please forgive us. We pray for more grace for all of us. I pray, Father, we would be a fighting force in your hand tonight. Guide and direct us at how we should pray, Lord, what we should pray for. Bring it to our, our remembrance. I pray the Holy Spirit would use this time. And Lord, we would begin to see even change here in Riverside, even in our own lives. So, Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lord, that when we see you move, we've seen so many stories in the Old Testament when you went against a vast army, Father. You destroyed them all in just one night. We have a lot of armies and a lot of enemies coming into our land. Not all of them. A lot, many of them are decent people, but the enemy is using this opportunity to weaken us. So guide us. Use this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Well, let's get...